together. Worship the Lord. Let's put our hands together. Let's sing out joyful, 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 joyful.
sins covered in your blood. And now a relationship with the creator of the heavens and earth. You'll never grow tired of praising and worshiping and thanking you, Jesus. You are the one who saves. We praise you for that. Bless our time together. seat, find someone, maybe a new person that you can introduce yourself to. Good morning, everybody. If I do say almost Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Everybody ready for that? Can I say that yet? No, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. Well, good morning. We have a, a great day today, as always. Um, Especially, though, because we have Ben and Emily Spector here from Croatia. And if I might say this as well, they're our favorite missionaries. So uh, Jason didn't like that first service. <laughs> so it'll be good to hear from them. They're going to share a little bit about just what's going on in Croatia. And uh, thanks. <laughs> I just thought you are playing some music over there. Oh, a little yeah. background. Thanks. No. That's right. I'll make an was very brief this morning. We have a lot going on. So uh, we had a good weekend. We had the singles retreat. And the Lord spoke just great things to the singles. That was good. Thank you for your prayers for that. We had a ladies' uh, breakfast, Christmas breakfast yesterday. That was just a great time. It was a special time, spend time together. And uh, since it is Christmas, we have a lot going on this week. We have the sweater um, parties for the youth, uh, both junior high and um, Senior high this week. We also have coming up this Wednesday is the Children's Ministry Junior Bread Night. So if you want to bring your kids out for that, then have a great time with that. And lastly, just about Christmas. We, uh, this coming Sunday, one week from today, is our Christmas service. So you're all going to want to come to that. It's going to be a great time. We have a Christmas choir. Uh, Pastor Ron's going to be giving a special Christmas message. So it's a great time to celebrate Christmas together as a, as a church uh, family. So come out for that. Couple of two other announcements. The Bible's to Haiti. We talked about that two weeks ago. And just thank you so much for just your generosity. Um, we, like I said, seven fifty, seven dollars and fifty cents puts a Bible in the hands of someone in Haiti. And so you guys gave um, just abundantly. And just want to let you know, we have a few more weeks to do that. If you haven't done that so yet, we'd like just everybody to be able to give some Bibles to the people and they need the Word of God. And so thank you for those who've given. And we can always give more. It's Christmas time, so it'd be a great thing to do. And lastly, last announcement, the information table uh, is in need of some volunteers to help out. A very simple way to volunteer the church. And it's also uh, just a nice way to um, just get to know new people, to care for people. Pastor Ron's message, la message last week instructed us what we're supposed to love one another, care for one another. So if you want to do that, the information table would love for you to come and volunteer. Just sign up there. Lastly, if you uh, need to leave the sanctuary during the teaching of God's Word, there's a couple of rows in the back so we can limit distractions. And remember your cell phones. Now, uh, just before we pray, my wife, uh, she just came in here. She was frazzled. She was serving the children's ministry. Lots going on there. And uh, last service, right before service, I had a lot going on. It was just frazzled. So we just need to calm our hearts. We come into service. We ask the Lord to mellow our hearts, get ready for the service. So let's do that now as we pray. Ask Him to calm our hearts. He can speak to us what he wants to speak to us. Lord, I pray for each person here today. Um, whatever that you want to speak to them, that you would do that, Lord. We, we pray for Ben and Emily. We thank you that they're going to share with us. We pray what Ben shares with the Lord. You'd speak to us what, you, what we need to hear and we would receive it. We pray, pray as Pastor Ron shares uh, from the book of Acts. Lord, it would instruct us. It would encourage us. It would help us to uh, just speak the Christians you want us to be. And we thank you now that we get to worship you, Lord. As we, as we worship you, as these songs um, just touch our hearts, as we listen to the words, as we sing them, they would be pleasing to you, and it would also uh, prepare us, get us ready for what you want to speak to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us.
Oh Lord, we proclaim your power and your glory this morning. And our hearts, Lord God, are so greatly encouraged that you sit on the throne. We're so greatly comforted by the fact that you'll come again. But we confess to you this morning too, Lord, that so many of our hearts are heavy hearted, that the number of parents are grieving brokenhearted, the loss of their little ones, Lord, this last week. We want to lift them up in prayer, Lord. We want to ask that you would just cover their broken hearts in your love. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would use this senseless tragedy to bring people closer to you, Lord. We trust the sovereign hand of God. Oh, Lord, we know that you could have prevented it in your infinite wisdom and, and omniscience, things that we do not understand. You allowed that to take place. And perhaps, Lord, it is to remind us of the wickedness of a man's heart. God, will you, according to your word, take that which man meant for evil and work it for good, we ask. We pray for others, Lord, in our church body who are going through difficult times, Lord, as there seems to be a wave of just rebelliousness among teens. And give those parents strength and wisdom <clears throat> on how they can allow you to bring them through those situations, O oh Lord. We pray for those who are anxious about work situations in employment, would you minister to them, O oh Lord? Those who are suffering from ill health, Lord God, those who are going through uh, difficult times through treatment and emotional distress, Lord God, would you just minister in a profound way to those situations? You know what they are, Lord. Only you know what needs to be done. We pray for Laura Lindsay, Lindsley's father's friend, Lord, who's in the final stages of battling cancer, O oh God. We pray, Lord God, for the Bennetts as they're in the Philippines for Christmas. We ask that you would just bless their time with Jeanette's family, Lord God. We want to pray for those who are with child, Lord. Just pray that you would give these dear sisters full-term pregnancies, healthy deliveries, comfort those who are waiting for your timing for children. Be with those who are just embracing the foster care and just the children that they receive. And, oh, Lord, just may they just pour the love of Christ into their little hearts, Lord God, in whatever time they have them. We thank you for that ministry that takes place here in our church, oh, Lord. We pray for those in the military. Watch over them and protect them and comfort families who no doubt are missing them. And we pray for our president and his administration, and we pray, Lord God, that you would bring our president under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and that he would lead our nation in a heart of repentance, O oh God. For we're turning our backs on you. Forgive us, Lord. We pray, Lord God, for all of our missionaries, and we ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon them, and that you would give them strength of heart and encourage them. Be with little Ella Ibbotson, Lord God, as she's back in the hospital, we pray that it's not pneumonia, and just that fill Ivan and Michelle with your peace. We pray, Lord God, just for our children's ministry or by junior high. We thank you for this facility, Lord, which you're so gracious to provide for us. We thank you, Lord, for the work you're doing at the orphanage. And Lord, we're just grateful to have you in our lives and have you directing us. Thank you for bringing Ben and Emily here safely. Be with everyone, Lord, as they're traveling. So many different people are traveling during the Christmas season. Thank you, Lord God, just for this facility. Thank you for our children's ministry and our by junior high. And thank you, Lord God, just for the opportunity you've given us in this past year, and we look forward to what's to come and just extending far outside these walls. Thank you, Lord, just for the sweet time we had as a sing at the singles retreat, Lord. Would you just take that word that was sown and, and just impact lives through that word? We ask, Lord, that you would now just continue to 
Pour out your spirit upon us as we continue in an attitude of worship through our tithes and our offerings. We're keenly aware, Lord God, that you don't need our money. But we're also aware, Lord God, that you use those resources to further your kingdom and ask that you would give the eldership wisdom, even in their meeting this afternoon, to be able to make right decisions, God-breathed decisions on how to care for the flock and ministries you would have us support, Lord. Give us wisdom on how to invest our resources wisely, O Lord. And so, Lord, as we give unto you, we pray that you would receive that as an expression of our trust and our faith and our confidence in who you are in our lives. We pray these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God from blessings i uh-huh.
whenever we sing of your holiness, we're reminded of our sinfulness and then instantly reminded of the cross that took away our sins and enabled us, Lord, to lift holy hands and to rejoice in great intimacy with the most holy of holies, the living God. We praise you and we thank you for that truth, that encouragement. It is in your name we sing. It is in your name we proclaim these spiritual truths in song. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> well, before we get, studi- get started uh, this morning in our study through Acts chapter 20, I want to invite uh, Ben to come on up, Ben Spector from uh, Croatia. I made the mistake, uh, I talked to Ben, I try to talk to him once a week, usually we hit about maybe three times out of the, three weeks out of the month, just to touch bases, and I mentioned, are you excited to come home? And uh, if I recall, he said, we're excited to come to Washington, but our home is in Croatia. And I loved that truth, I love that about their hearts. And what a blessing it has been for me in the last uh, year, maybe a little over, no, I think in the last year, we've been to, I've been to Croatia twice, and of course many of you know that my wife and I were able to go and stay in their little uh, small apartment. And how many square feet is that, bro? Like 60 square meters. I don't know if okay, so it's small. That 60 square meters is like small, that's what that means. And, uh, <laughs> But here's the awesome thing. Um, Jenny and I were so moved and touched just by their humble abode, which was just, I mean, it was, and it decorated nice, and she fixed some great meals, and just sitting in their their little living area and uh, talking and praying and just being with them, that, that Jenny and I were just really praying about just downsizing and uh, so that we can just be more effective for the Lord, so we can give more for the Lord, more resources for the Lord. And that, the other day we were talking about it and Jenny said, you know, just being there with Ben and Emily, you just realize that uh, how content you can be living with such little. And And you get back here and you realize, oh my word, and I don't know how many of you have tried to downsize before, but it's like, whoa, where do you even begin to get rid of the stuff that, I've got so much stuff that I think I'm going to, I've been thinking I'm going to use for like 10 years. You would think it should be like the two-year rule, that if you haven't used it in two years, you're probably not going to use it, just throw it away. And uh, so we're really blessed. They're, they are some of our favorite uh, missionaries, I wouldn't go so far as to say the favorite, but here's what I'd say about our missionaries. They're, they're special to us in different ways. And this couple's special to us because Emily went to our first missions trip in Mexico in, while she was in high school. She was in our junior high ministry, our high school ministry, and then the Lord took her and took another young man from uh, Philadelphia, and took them to Hungary, and the Lord brought them together, and now they live in Croatia. And so uh, let's welcome Ben. He's going to share with us a little bit uh, about what the Lord is doing with him in Croatia. Um, We are very blessed to be here. We wanted to, I said this last service, we really wanted to thank you guys for allowing Ron to come um, be with us twice. I know it's not easy to give up uh, your, your pastor for, you know, he was in Europe for a month almost, and two of those weeks was with us. So, um, but that, that, that's, that's an opportunity that, that a lot of missionaries don't get. We know a lot of different missionaries from different churches, and um, some of them don't even get visits from their missions pastor, you know, let alone the senior pastor of um, one of their supporting churches. And um, So we wanted to thank you for that, and Yes, I am the guy that stole Emily from you guys. That is my reputation around here. Um, <laughs> so don't kill me while I'm up here. Um, so I have this cool little pointer thing. So um, I wanted to 
kind of give you guys a rundown of a little bit about who we are. Ron kind of covered that. Um, just a little bit of information about Croatia. I shared this last year as well, but for those of you who uh, are new and weren't here last year, I'm going to share some, some new information just about where it is, um, what it's like there, some statistics and stuff, um, show you guys some pictures, um, what has happened with Emily and I this past year, just to kind of give you guys a quick update and, um, and show you uh, a little bit more. So, um, <clears throat> this is Croatia. So, uh, this is Europe. There's Italy, the big boot. This right here is the Adriatic Sea. Down here is the Mediterranean. So, um, over here in this area is Greece, and over here is France and Spain. This is Africa. Um, so, this is where Croatia is, for those of you who don't know. It was part of the former Yugoslavia. Here's Serbia, and this is Bosnia, and Slovenia, and Macedonia. These are very um, famous war places, for those of you who remember that. So, this is where it is. Got some cool animations going for you guys to keep you awake through my blabbering. This, um, so here's the country. The population is about four and a half million people. It's four million three hundred thousand people um, and I want to explain this uh, statistic for you um, it, there's a site called joshuaproject.net I think it's dot net um, and they're kind of like Operation World for those of you who know the book Operation World it's a prayer guide to pray through all the countries in the world and they give you how many Christians are present in each country what specific needs are um, which major Christian organizations are there, whether you know, there's Baptist churches there and stuff, or Presbyterians, or uh, so on. And Joshua Project kind of does the same thing, but they, 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 they do a really good job at listing the statistics for um, the, the, the religion groups in each country. So for Croatia, um, it's categorized as 92.4% Christian. Now, what this means, when we break that down, they do another chart. It means 92.9% of that 92.4% is Roman Catholic. And 0.3% is Protestant. And for the evangelical part of Christianity that they categorize, it's 0.1%. They don't even list it because it's so small. Um, <clears throat> and Croatia is not a large country. Four and a half million people is the size um, of the city of Philadelphia where I'm from originally. So um, it's not a huge country. But the fact that 0.3%, you can't, and on Joshua Project, they give you these cool little pie charts. So I put one up on here for you guys to see. So this is Roman Catholic. This 7.7% is just other parts of Christianity, Orthodox Christianity. Um, and this little sliver right here, you can barely see it. It's in red. Um, and there's the 0.3%. That is... Um, the Protestant section of Christianity. So the country um, is a harvest field. Um, there, we would love to see more laborers there. Uh, and there's, there, there's a huge need. There's still towns of 40,000 people um, that have never had a church. I think even Ording. You, you guys know where Ording is? That's Emily, my, my father-in-law is the, like, He's not the mayor. He's the guy under the mayor there. It's 7,000 people, and they have like, I don't know, two or three churches there. Towns of 40,000 people that don't have churches. 15,000 people. That's twice the size of Ording. Don't have, they've never had a church, ever. There's probably people in these places that have never heard the gospel. Um, and, and this is huge. Um, and this, this is kind of how Emily, this is part of why Emily and I are, are there, to be um, spreading the gospel. So you can see that, that sliver. I just took away everything else. Just that sliver remains. Um, let's see. So, um, I said this last service. There's, I'll explain all this, this, the, this pin in a second. But um, there's, there's even, you know, this is the town that we first moved to when we came to Croatia. It's called Split, like banana split. And there's a mountain range right about, right about here. And this is southern Croatia. So northern Croatia is up here where the Dove is. And this is southern Croatia. And there's, you know, when everybody goes down to 
If any of you have ever seen pictures of the Croatian coast, it's, it's magnificent. It's like if there's one place you could go for vacation, it would be the Croatian coast. It's gorgeous. So even people in Croatia, when they go down here, they go to Split, they go to Dubrovnik, and then they go to some little towns like Makarska here. They go to these places, or Šibenik, Zadar, and these are bigger towns. So they're, they're going straight over the mountains, getting there. But there's all these towns. Look, Gospić, this, this is a bigger town. So about, I think it's around 10,000 people. And there's all these little towns in the midst here, seen. Um, they have no churches, nothing. People forget about them. They go straight past them. You, the tourists, the Croatians. Um, I was talking to Damir, the pastor of the church that we're working out with right now, and he just said his heart breaks for these, these cities in here. There's, just, there's nothing. People forget about them. There's people there that have probably never heard the real good news of Jesus Christ because they're, they're listening to the traditions of the Catholic Church and, and what they're teaching them. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit about the, the spiritual state of, um, of the country that we're serving and living in. Um, so last year, for those of you who remember, uh, Emily and I got married in spring of 2011. 2011, yes. And then we moved to Split, Croatia, right here. We moved there in um, September 2011. And we were, uh, when we went, we committed two years to another missionary couple that was there um, just to serve under them. They had a small little home, home group there. And we wanted to commit two years to them just to learn language, learn culture, learn the way of life, kind of get our feet wet before we start stepping into to bigger um, responsibilities if you want to put it that way. And um, so shortly after we got there, though, we were there about six or seven months, and they informed us that, um, that they were moving back to the States. I felt like the Lord was, telling, was directing them to move back to the States, which was a very big shock for Emily and I. Emily and I did not know this before going. So <laughs> um, through a lot of prayer, and this is, this is actually the time, it's very funny because Ron had already pre-planned a trip to come out and see us. And he just so happened to be coming 10 days after they had told us, Emily and I are kind of, what is going on with our lives? What are we going to do? Um, and so thank you for graciously allowing Ron to come. And he was a great help to us. And just praying through these things, asking the Lord, what do you want us to do? Um, and 20 years earlier uh, from today, um, my, my pastor back in Philadelphia, Joe Foch, he, he, helped, um, he helped a man named Amir. You guys met him. A lot of you met him. He was here with his wife uh, in September. Um, he helped Pastor Damir start a church up in Chakovets, Croatia, all the way up north. So we're, we were down here, and now we're up here. So um, he helped Damir start this church, and Damir's been pastoring this church for 20 years and so we had Emily and I going, moving to Split. We, we, we knew Damir. We had started building a relationship with him. We were visiting. And when this other couple told us that they were leaving, he invited us to come up and serve with them at the church. Um, and so through a lot of prayer, we, we ended up making that decision. And um, so now we are living up north. Uh, we are no longer by the ocean. We are where they have very good meat and cheese and very hardworking people. So there's no fish. Um, but that's not really meat, so even vegetarians eat fish. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is this is where Emily and I have been for the past uh, seven months. Um, we've been serving with uh, with Damir and his wife uh, Bo, who you guys met. This is the the city center of Chakovets. It's very pretty, very European. Um, and uh, we're serving in the church. We are taking time to learn language, taking time to learn culture. I think um, some of the biggest things that we've been realizing this past year is just the importance of laying a good foundation. I think a lot of times as missionaries, especially just as Americans, we can come into a place, we go on a mission trip, and we, we give ourselves a, a platform that we step on because, you know, we're Americans. We know how to do everything, right? And so... We give ourselves a platform to start saying things and start directing things. But that's, you, you can't give yourself a platform. It, ha, it, it has to be given to you, you know. You have to learn how to 
gain the respect of people. And so it's not America. So Emily and I have been having to, to readjust our whole lifestyle so that we're now relate, so, so, to, to become relatable to, to, to Croatians. Not, not be fake, but be relatable. And that's learning their language, learning their culture. Because if my, and you know, if Emily and I are witnessing to somebody, and we have no idea how to relate to Croatians, and we're doing this all in English, right? Instead of in Croatian. My message is going to seem foreign. The gospel is foreign in itself, right? Because because we're sinful, we're sinful humans. But the message, you know, but but there's a sense where where every culture can relate to it. We related to the gospel in some way. We can we saw it and we were saved. And so, for us, if we're foreign, then our message is foreign. People aren't gonna. Why, why would they want that? And even if people do get saved out of that then all the unbelievers are going to look at us and say, well, that's so weird. It's so Western. I don't understand it. I can't relate to that. I, I would never be a part of that. So it's very important, Emily and I have been realizing, to take the time to learn the language. So we're serving in a, in a church of about 200 people, a little bit less. Um, it's a fully Croatian church with only Americans there. Um, Damir is Croatian himself. He's been pastoring it for 20 years. We love serving under him. We respect him very much and love him. This is, the, um, this is in the city center. It's an old castle um, in Chakovets. Here's some pictures of where we live. This is the, uh, the open market, for, um, especially for you Northwesters. And over on the East Coast, we don't have a lot of those. Um, this is the street that we live on, actually. It's very, very pretty. Um, <clears throat> this is the church. Here's a church building now. It's out of, we just put a siding on this year. Looks very nice. Um, This is the sanctuary during a Sunday morning. Um, And there's some people. There's people afterwards fellowshipping. There's Pastor Damir, who you guys met. Um, And uh, we're we're missing it already. (coughs) There's Damir and Bo, his wife. Here's Emily and I, and these are very good friends, Miro and Andriana. We've uh, grown very close to them, and uh, we went on a little trip together recently. Uh, this is our other friend Ivana, and there's Andriana again. There's Emily. There's Emily again. We're, this is at a, one of the national parks in Croatia. It's very pretty, as you can see. This is um, Damir's daughter, Tonia. <coughs> He was at a church baptism. They baptized 14 people this past year. There's the believers. <clears throat> Here's Pastor Ron eating fish on his trip. It was very good fish, but it's not really meat. <laughs> this, was, um, this was on All Saints Day. Um, it's a Catholic holiday for those of you who don't know what it is. It's the day after Halloween. And uh, they, they, they light candles, they set candles on their, on their relatives' gravestones to help guide them to heaven. That's, that's really the point. It was very eye-opening to, to be a part of that and go to the graveyard. Um, and this, um, for those of you who know what uh, the Catholic Church has something called the Way of the Cross or, or the, 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 the Via Della Rosa. And it's, it's a, it's a, you have 14 stations. And each one depicts a part of Jesus' suffering up to, you know, uh, from before he was crucified to his crucifixion to his burial in the tomb. And so as you go through, you say certain prayers um, and all that good stuff. Not good stuff, but yes. And so we, um, we found one of these on a trip that we took at a, at a town called Chabar. And we noticed it was just very eye-opening because you see Jesus here. And this is obviously Mary, but who's who's receiving praise? Who's receiving the worship here? Now this is this is huge in Croatia because you, you don't you, you never see Jesus getting the glory. It's always it's always Mary, and this is people love Mary in Croatia. If you talk bad about Mary, it's like you're done. No, no, you do not talk bad about about Mary. And it's very sad. People are very deceived and, 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 and they're, they're very stuck in their traditions. Um, 
And when in Croatia, when, when you become a Christian, you're, you're, you're not, Damir, Pastor Damir is telling me, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not like in, in a Muslim culture where, where you're beat, you know. You're not like beat physically, but you're, you, you, you get beat up socially. Everything is very community oriented in, in Croatia. It's not like here, like community here in America is Facebook. That's, that's our community now. It's very sad. And, um, but in Croatia, like, Damir built his house next to his mom. And then his brother and sister-in-law live above his mom. And so everybody kind of has a family compound where they all live. And so if you're a Christian, you're the, you're the one person in your family. You have, you have grandma, you have grandpa, you got your mom, dad, you got your brother and sister, their husband or wife, their children. You're all living together and you're the one Christian. Think about how your life's going to look. Because here, we're very individualistic. We say, do something for your life. It's your life. Live it the way you want to live it. Do something with it. Make yourself into what you want to be. And I'm, I'm sure that they, that, they, that they say those things in Croatia, right? But it's, it's, there's a different mindset going on. Society affects you a lot more than it does here in, here in America. We're very individualistic. And they're very community-oriented. So when you become a Christian, it is not a light deal. Um, and so th- this, this, I think, just perfectly portrays what the spiritual state of Croatia is right now. Um, and it's very uh, heartbreaking to look at. Um, so right now, Emily and I are really just, we're serving in the church. We're enjoying our time, learning the language, learning the people, um, being able to become relate- relatable, relatable to them. Sorry, my English is going. And, um, and just, the, we're, we're finding out that, that the language is the key to their hearts. When you, when you understand their language, can relate to them, and then you can, it's the key to their hearts. This is where I'm going to end. Um, as I was saying, there's towns throughout all of Croatia that have, that have never had churches. This one, Bielovar, 40,000 people. Ogolin, 15,000. Gospic, I think around 10,000. Zagreb has a million and a half people in it, in a country of four and a half million people. That's huge. Everybody has to go to Zagreb. There's about, I think, there's only a couple churches there. There's no Calvary Chapel there either. Um, and so, Emily and I, um, just to kind of update you guys as, as a church, our plan is, is to go back to Chakovets and continue to, to learn these things. And, but Lord willing, one day we want to head out to one of these towns or a different town in Croatia and um, see a church planted. You know, and really that just means proclaiming the gospel and seeing people come because a church is a natural product of that. So... Um, we thank you guys for your support. Thank you for listening. Um, we feel very at home here, and uh, we're very glad to be back. And uh, pray for us. Pray for the country. Um, I'm not going to have these today, but on Wednesday, next Sunday, and then the following Wednesday on the 26th, Emily and I made, uh, we, we, I sat down with Amir. We chose four different towns in Croatia, and we made prayer cards for them. So it has a map. It shows where the town is, a little bit of information about the town on the back. And so if, if you guys, you know, we, we, we want you guys to, to be able to get involved and to be able to join with us in this, you know, that, that, that's the point. Um, and so we want to give you guys ways to do that. And one, one of the ways that, that you can is, is next Wednesday or Sunday, we're going to have a sign-up sheet. You can sign up, and we'll assign you a town to pray for. You, have, you get a little card. It'll show you where it is. You can keep it in your Bible. You can pray for the town. You can look up stuff, more stuff about this town online. Um, and a lot, three of these four towns don't have any churches, so these are fresh places where the gospel needs to be proclaimed. Um, so that's all I got. Thanks. Well, let's pray. It'll be exciting to be able to pray for those towns and then watch the Lord um, move in such a way that they would go and be a part of planning a church there and then unfortunately we'd have to probably put a team together to go and to support them as i was looking at the streets and just seeing the places we would go and get gelato and go different places and hang out and just oh it is such jenny of all the places uh, we visited this last summer and visited missionaries she loved all of the missionaries she loved visiting them but she loved croatia 
the most in terms of just the country and the feel and the town. And so downsize and see how you, the Lord might have you be involved. He may have you be involved in a church plant in Croatia. Wouldn't that be awesome to be a part of that so you can start polishing up on your Croatian? Um, true? Very true. Let's pray for them. Father God, we thank you so much for this dear couple. We ask that you would just continue to minister to them, that their time here would be not only refreshing, but it would also be a time of just preparation for what you have for them in the, in the months and in the years to come, oh God. We thank you for their willing to live sacrificially for the furthering of your kingdom. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the part that you allow us to be a part of that. And so we ask, Lord, that you would just minister to them and encourage them and give them strength of heart, keep them strong and healthy, and prepare the hearts of the people in Croatia, Lord. You know which town needs a, the, the church that they would be a part of, and we ask that you would just uh, link the two together as they delight in you and as they trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. Thanks, What a great, great opportunity the Lord's given us as a church. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, uh, beginning in verse 17, and you need to not be concerned at all. We're not going to uh, spend the hour that we normally spend in the Word, but we're going to have a little bit of a condensed time. But I do want to take some time, Acts chapter 20. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand, and one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. <clears throat> we had an amazing time at the singles retreat this last uh, yesterday and Saturday. It was the first time we've had a singles retreat here at the church. And there was over 30 single men and women of all ages that were there. And it was the first retreat that I've ever been to where I walk in before registration, the registrations tables there, and all of the name tags are laid out. And there was one individual that was going to come the next morning, so we knew that there would be one name tag left over. But usually there's always half a dozen or so because people just, for whatever reason, don't make it. Every one of the name tags was gone. And the next morning, the individual that was going to join us was there bright and early, ready to go. It was a fabulous time. I, I, I was so blessed to be able to gather together with him, to fellowship, to worship, to seek the Lord through his word, just sharing our lives together. And please continue to pray for not only just the things that we talked about, the things that are certainly stirring on my heart. This is a, a group of, of brothers and sisters who are faithfully serving in our body. And, and uh, I have just such a heart for just being single in a, in a couple's world in, in one way or another. And you'll, you can bet that in the coming year, you're going to be hearing a little bit more about uh, just some of the things that the Lord spoke to us. As for me personally, as I was there, as I listened to their hearts for the Lord, as we spent 24 hours in this big room, we sat in a circle. It was very informal. I taught sitting in a chair from just, I didn't have a podium or music stand or anything. <coughs> And I was moved more than ever in two things, among many, but two things in particular. One is how precious the souls of these sisters and brothers were. And secondly, the immense responsibility it is as a pastor, as a shepherd of God's flock, to care for the souls of these precious saints. And of course, that extends to each one of you, and it extends to our children's ministry and our junior high ministry, our high school ministry. But specifically, our focus was these uh, brothers and sisters who at this particular point in time are single. And I just immediately could not help but think of Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. And I think it ties in perfectly with what we're going to look at here in Acts chapter 20. As I'm humbled to know that we as leaders, whether you're a student ministry leader, whether you're a home fellowship leader, whether you're a women's ministry team leader, whether you're a pastor, an elder, and in many respects even as, as parents leading your children, we are people who must give an account to God. 
for how well we fulfilled our calling to care for people's souls. It is a very serious business for the Lord. Well, this morning we're going to, I thought we were going to conclude <coughs> chapter 20, and we are actually going to read through the remaining of the chapter from 17 to 38. But you'll see later on we're going to stop for very good reason at verse uh, 28. And we're going to see this, we're going to continue to see this consistent theme, which is what we've been seeing throughout chapter 20, of just God's love expressed through this man by the name of Paul, a man who was once intent on destroying the church of God, who, who now was demonstrating unequal love for those whom God had put in his care. Two weeks ago, if you remember, we looked at what it was that drove Paul in his passion for the Lord, and we, we saw that that passion resulted in his care <coughs> for others. And what drove him was the fact that he never forgot what God had delivered him from. And that he had transformed his life on that road to Damascus. Who was once a murderer, he now became uh, a representative of the light of Christ to preach the gospel to others when Jesus changed his life. Just this morning in our Bible reading through uh, a year we read in Amos 5, 8, that God turns the shadow of death into mourning. God has a way of just taking the darkest of situations, the darkest of times, and as I sat at the, at the dinner table, we had, in fact, I think you ought to do, we ought to do this at every retreat. It actually was great. I just said, you cannot sit at this, with the same people at any one meal. You have to switch it up. You have to sit with new people at every meal. And it really provided me with the opportunity to talk to a lot of different people. And I just, my, one of my favorite things to do was just talk about how God had delivered us out of darkness and ushered us into the light. And I want to just encourage you that if you haven't talked to somebody recently who just shared with you how dead in their sin they once were and now they're alive in Christ, boy, I would encourage you to do that. It just feeds and encourages your soul. And then if you remember last week, we looked at the most excellent way that that being several practical ways in which we can love one another, and I trust that you had a productive week in doing so. But this morning, we're going to spend uh, some time, we're going to consider what it means practically for shepherds, for leaders, to love their flocks. Or in effect, um, we're going to look at what we glean from Paul's ministry in learning how to care for the body of Christ. And I believe that it, as is often as the case, the timing of this message is perfect for two reasons. One reason is uh, because we're having an eldership meeting today, and the second is, is because we're getting ready for Vision Sunday, and the Lord has been stirring a lot on our hearts of how can we expand our leadership base, our, our pastoral shepherding and care base so that we can make sure that nobody slips through the cracks and we can care effectively uh, for people in watching over their souls. We want to be able to do that because that's what God has called us to do. And so the Lord has good things in store for us as we just look at these, these verses. So let's stand together and let's read them <clears throat> together if we can. Beginning of verse 17, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, that is Paul, and when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. 
For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I've coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in a way, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus <coughs> that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had paid these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And then they well wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Oh Lord, we ask that you would just speak to our hearts now as we open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to your word. And we ask that you would teach us, Lord, as leaders, how we're to care for people's souls and that you would teach our church what it is they can expect from that care. Lord, we want to not just do church, we want to be your church, that we might impact the world for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I love that we had Ben and Emily share with us, or Ben share with us this morning, and the things that are going on in Croatia, how God's using them in Croatia, preparing them for this long-term work that the Lord has for them. And it's exciting because we've been studying through Paul's missionary journeys, his first missionary journey, then his second one, and now his third one as we're just coming to an end. In the next couple of weeks, we'll see that he ends up in Jerusalem and getting arrested and all, and we'll get into that time. But this is his last missionary journey. And I think it's exciting because the Lord has been stirring upon our hearts how we need to reflect in our thinking as it applies to missions and our involvement in the lives of those serving in the mission field. And I'm finding just consistently as Ben graciously thanked us for being able to come and to see him, I think it's sad that, that there isn't much more of that that's going on. Uh, certainly there's times when it's expensive to do that and, and certainly there are times when the church just doesn't feel, you know, let's just send them a check and let's pray for them but it has made a significant impact to be able to go and to spend time with them, strengthening them in the Lord. And we read, if you'll just flip back to Acts chapter 14, beginning of verse 21, we see that Paul would go back to the churches <coughs> that he had established, and he would encourage them, and he would strengthen the church members' souls. And if you'll notice in verse 21, it says, when they had preached the gospel of chapter 14 to that city, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So what did they appoint these elders to do? And I want our leadership of, of all sorts, I want you to pay close attention because we're going to get an exhortation from Paul from the inspired word of God of how we're to care for the flock of God. And we see that they would go in and he would strengthen their souls. And one of the ways that he would do that would appoint, appoint elders. And you read in Second Timothy or First Timothy chapter 3, you read about the qualifications of an elder and, or, or a shepherd or a leader or pastor and they would care for the people's souls. They would encourage them in their spiritual growth. And in our text, we learn specifics as to what that looks like, and knowing this serves two purposes. Number one, it serves the purpose of the leaders here knowing what's expected of them, and number two, it tells you who are being cared for what you can expect from your leadership. And so as we begin to read in verse 17, it says, from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Now, bear in mind, when you're reading through the New Testament, when you come across the term a pastor, shepherd, overseer, a bishop, these are all different titles which come from the same Greek word, <coughs> presbyteros. And so clearly, Paul, he's, a, he's a, uh, 
addressing the eldership or the leadership of the church in Ephesus. And isn't it interesting that just recently, as we were reading through the Bible in a year, in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, Jesus addresses the church at Ephesus, and he says this. He says, I know your works and your labor and your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you've tested those who say they're apostles and not, and you've, ha you've found them to be <clears throat> liars, and you've persevered and you have patience and you've labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. But then Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And he goes on to say, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, one of the responsibilities in caring for the souls of the flock is to make sure that they never leave their first love, that they never leave their first love. It is the most important love they ever have, their love for Jesus Christ. Your love for Jesus Christ must surpass the love you have for anyone else in your family, including your spouse. Because if your love for Jesus Christ surpasses your love for your spouse, then your love for your spouse will, will it'll just flow through Jesus' love. And it'll be a powerful love that'll hold a marriage tightly together. It says in verse 18, And when they had come to know, know Paul, he said to them, <clears throat> you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility and with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly from ha house to house, testifying uh, to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to just stop here for a minute, and I want to draw your attention to five things, five very simple and yet uh, key things, five specific qualities or characters, characteristics of Paul's exhortation that should be applied to leadership, to the leadership style of every leader in our church. Every leader here, you can expect as a flock being led by those leaders that you will see these characteristics. And if you don't see those characteristics, then you need to come and talk to me or to, to one of us because we gotta, we gotta see what's going wrong. What's wrong there if you're not seeing these characteristics? Number one, verse 19, we see humility. Paul says, when I was among you, you saw how I served with all humility. Paul was a humble man who went from the the greatness in the world's eye of being a Pharisee and being a, a member of the Sanhedrin to being blinded for three days, having to be led around by someone else when Jesus approached him on the road to Damascus. And on that road, Jesus so transformed Paul that from that point forward, he remained a humble servant of God, caring for the souls of the sheep until he was executed by the Roman Emperor Nero for his allegiance, not to the king of Rome, but for his allegiance to the king of kings. And so we need to understand that as leaders, we must remain humble. This is God's church. These are his souls. These are his saints. This is not Pastor Ron's church. This isn't the eldership's church. These are people, and this is a church, his bride that God has put us in charge of caring for and being able to minister to. And so one quality that every leader must have in our church in any situation, I don't care what, what ministry it's in, is that they must be a man or a woman of humility. And then secondly, also in verse 9, he added to that humility tremendous empathy and compassion. Notice it says, with many tears and trials, I served you. If we desire to be good leaders, we must have empathy and compassion for those whom we are serving. We must never grow weary and impatient with them. We mustn't ever become cynical in our representation of the Lord to them because they call too many times or they ask too many questions <clears throat> or they just always come and they want to talk to you. We mustn't ever get impatient with them because God loves them with an everlasting love demonstrated by his 
blood, his shed blood on the cross as he did for you and for me. And notice here that Paul adds trials to those tears. Trials are one of those tools that God uses to make us more like him. I am the pastor that I am. I'm the man of of, of faith that I am. I have the relationship that I have with the Lord that I have because of the trials that I've gone through. Were they fun? No. Uh, do I, can I, am I just crossing my fingers and can't wait for more to come? No. But when they come, we embrace them and need to realize that it is through our trials that we grow the closest to God. 2 Corinthians 13 uh, or chapter, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, Jesus uh, had come to Paul and encouraged him that it is through those trials that he's able to be strong, that it's through those trials that he shows his grace being sufficient. Number three, we see in verse 20 that Paul was generous. I love that. He was generous. He kept nothing back that was helpful. As leaders, we must be willing to give our all. We must keep nothing back. We must seek to know the will of the Lord for the flock, seeking to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit that we follow his leading in how we can best help the church. We must be generous with our time, uh, with our concern, with our care. We mustn't be distracted when we're talking with someone. That's why uh, some of you, God bless you, I know that you come and you, you, you wait and to, to talk to me after a service or to talk to one of the other pastors after the service. And believe me, if I could, I would want to talk to every one of you. But one thing that I've told myself early on in the ministry is I'm not going to cut this person short of the questions they're asking, the concerns that they have, and the opportunity to pray with them because a couple of other people are waiting. And so I, I would love for you to wait, but then again, recognize that there's other people that are more than eager to pray with you. And we want to make sure that we're not distracted with other things, but that we are taking the time to be generous in the attention and the time that we're giving to the people we're ministering to. And number four, also in verse 20, it says that Paul taught publicly <coughs> and from house to house. We're to take every opportunity to teach God's word and never limit such teaching to the teacher or the shepherd who teaches from the pulpit on Wednesdays and Sundays. Those are public gatherings. However, we mustn't neglect the opportunities the Lord gives us to teach from house to house in our home fellowships, in the various restaurants, and in, in the various Bible studies, in one-on-one -on -one appointments that we have with people. In every venue possible, we must teach the word of God. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so we must seek to teach the, the, the sheep at every opportunity God's word in hopes that they too might begin to teach others. And then number 5 in verse 21, Paul taught and preached, he proclaimed <coughs> repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. Listen, the worst thing that we as leaders could do for the flock is to fail to teach repentance and faith. Because without repentance, faith can never come. Without repentance, salvation will never come. Mark chapter 1, we read when Jesus began his ministry, he proclaimed the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of, of, of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So belief in the gospel, salvation that comes through hearing and receiving the gospel, it will never come without a heart that is repentant. And so five things we see here very clearly that the leadership is to be about in demonstrating their their, their character as leaders and things that the flock can expect from them are to see them leading in humility, to see them leading with empathy and compassion, to see them serving generously, keeping nothing back, teaching publicly and from house to house, and then making sure that we're teaching repentance and faith. 
And then we see in verse 22 where Paul says, Now, see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Now, I don't know what about you, but I want you to imagine going into a city, in this case it would be Jerusalem, where you know that what awaits you is not a little man holding a sign that says, welcome to Jerusalem, or anything like that, or a tour bus guide, bring your luggage over here, but you have somebody that's waiting there that's holding a bunch of shackles, and he's ready to uh, arrest you, he's ready to take you, and perhaps put you into an inner prison, he's ready to uh, maybe even beat you to just within your life, or maybe even kill you. Imagine that happening, I, I can't imagine. I love going to visit missionaries. I love just strengthening their souls. And I love that part where you get off the plane, especially in Croatia. And the first time we went and saw Ben and Emily, and you get off the plane, and there's a, a glass there, and all the people are waiting, and you can see them as you're going in, uh, coming off the plane and getting ready to go to the luggage, and they're just sitting there waving, and you just can't wait to get through customs and get over to see them. But imagine somebody waving, but they're waving chains and shackles and uh, swords and stuff and whips and they're just ready i'm thinking i wonder if there's a way i can get a return flight back on this plane i just got off of but that wasn't paul because paul he was zealous for the things of god he was bold and he was confident and would be to god that we might become bold enough christians and brave enough christians that we would not be easily shaken by the potential uh, threat of such things Literally, this suffering, this, these chains and this tribulation, notice it didn't deter Paul in any way. I'm certain he didn't like them, but he always kept in mind this greater cause and this greater purpose that far shadow, overshadowed any anxiousness or fear that the chains and the trials would have, have upon him. And that's an example to us. Look what he says in verse 24. He says, none of these things move me, nor do I count my, my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was single focused on what was important. He cared about nothing more in this life than completing the work that the Lord had for him. And I'm reminded myself of how easy it is to get caught up in trivial things that serve no purpose in helping others' souls. But in fact, they hinder the process of caring for the sheep. And there's a place to fellowship and to play some games and just enjoy fellowship with one another. <laughs> But sometimes we spend more time just being part of this club and that club and this organization and that organization, all in the name of Christ, and we never really talk about Christ. We never really engage one another in knowing how we can care for one another, how we can love one another. And Paul wasn't interested in that. We don't see him being in a lot of Christian clubs. In fact, we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, for I determined not to know anything among you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal and the prize for the, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In his last letter to Timothy, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the grace, I've kept the faith, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. And then he says something that made the, uh, the elders at Ephesus very, very sad. Look at verse 25. He says, and indeed, now I know that you, will, that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. How sad it must have been to hear Paul say this. Just imagine someone you love, someone who's helped you grow in your faith, someone who, who, who had cared for your soul. Imagine them not saying, see you tomorrow or see you on such and such a day, but rather, you will not see my face anymore. And I think of people who have impacted my life for the gospel, people that I love, people in this church that I serve with faithfully, day after day after day, and imagine one Wednesday or Sunday after church, they just say, 
you'll not see my face anymore. Imagine how these people felt. But then Paul says something that's very powerful. He says in verse 26, Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Now, why could Paul say that? He says this, because I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He's saying, oh, I just didn't tell you the things that you wanted to hear that would make you feel good. I didn't tell you things that you wanted to hear from the Word of God that would make you like me more. I, I was innocent of your blood because I did, not, I did not fail to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He no doubt understood what Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 said, when the Lord tells Ezekiel, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, <clears throat> that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But, Ezekiel, his blood I will require at your hand. And so Paul was able to say, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. Because I didn't get caught up in, in what's politically correct. I didn't get caught up in the foolishness of things. He, he said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men because I did not shun to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And if there's anything that the body of Christ needs today, it's the, the proclamation of the full counsel of God. Amen? The full counsel of God. And there's no doubt that Paul would have had this verse in mind as he was departing from them. He knew the scriptures well. He had dig diligently taught the scriptures publicly and from house to house, teaching the whole counsel of God, not just those things that made um, people feel comfortable. How many of you have heard of Halley's uh, Bible Handbook? How many of you have heard of that? Okay. It's a great little handbook. I would recommend great Christmas gift. I believe we have some of them in our bookstore and I would encourage you to, if you don't have that, get that. It's a great book that just takes you through every, all different kinds of parts of the Bible. It's a great book for helping you understand how the Bible's put together and what each theme. He, he was an amazing man that God uses mightily. But in his, Holly's Bible handbook, in the table of contents, you go down in the table of context and it's talking about all church history and the intertestamental period and all this. Then there's this one in bold letters. It says, page 836, the most important thing in this Bible. And here's what it says. I put the quote on the screen. The most important thing in this book is this simple question, that each church have a congregational plan of Bible reading. The church and the Bible go together. The church exists to proclaim and exalt the Christ of the Bible. And for nothing else, a church that does not enthrone the Bible in the lives of its people is false to its mission. And I wholeheartedly agree because I spent far too many years chasing winds of doctrine only to find <coughs> that such doctrines, they do nothing to feed people's souls, but rather they confuse their souls about the God of the Bible, and that must never be. It must never be. And therefore, verse 28, based on all of these things that I'm exhorting here, therefore, he says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Now, I love this. Notice this. He doesn't say to them, hey, make sure the flock does what you tell them to do. That's not what he says. He says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. In other words, don't you just... Tell them to take heed, but I want you to make sure that you're taking heed to these things as well, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd, to feed the souls of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now this verse is such a huge verse to me, it should be underlined in every one of our Bibles and highlighted. It should be meditated upon frequently. These souls that God has given us to care for have been purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They've been purchased. Now, I want you to try to fathom. I was holding a, a little Ethan Sharp, Melissa and Travis's little boy, this cutest little boy, is looking at me and probably thinking, ooh, that guy's strange, but he's just looking at me, and I was holding him, and I want you to imagine turning that over to somebody, 
to, 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 to kill to save your soul, to purchase your soul. That's what God did, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We must never forget this as leaders, that the souls of the people that we care for have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our souls were purchased, thereby enabling us to be assured of eternity in heaven. And as a result, our souls belong to him. And in turn, we've been entrusted to care for them. That's huge. That should be all we need to hear when we're finding ourselves impatient with the people that we're leading, the people that we're encouraging. Impatient when we're tired and people are coming and they want to be prayed for. All we need to remember is that the Lord in heaven the God of the whole earth is saying to us, you be careful how you handle that soul. My son purchased it with his blood. And I want to encourage right now, just right where you are, any leader in the church, home fellowship leader, youth leader, women's ministry leader, children's ministry leader, eldership, home fellowship leader, I want you to stand up right where you are, just right now. I want you to stand up right where you are, just really quickly. Make sure we're not missing anybody. All right, there we go. Anybody else? Pastor Jason, come on out here. Let's do some worship here. Yeah, come on out. Now here's what I want you to do. It's going to be radical. It's going to be craziness. No, I'm just kidding. I want you to just get up. Some of you who, that are standing off alone, like we've got Pastor Brian and his wife Tanya over here, and I want you to just go where you see somebody standing, and I want you to lay a hand on their shoulders. We're going to pray for them. I want some of you to come up, Pastor Jason, and I, I could certainly use prayer. i got no problem with that. So just get up and go wherever you need to go. Come on, don't be shy. And I want you to just lay hands on their shoulder. Hold their hand, whatever you want to do. Come up here. God bless you guys. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray for these dear shepherds that they would take to heart the responsibility of watching over your souls in a manner that honors God's willingness to give his son's blood for them. Amen. Father God, we come before you right now. We thank you, Lord, for these dear saints. We're humbled, Lord, I'm humbled to be called a shepherd. I confess, Lord, there's times when I, I, I grow tired, I grow weary. There's times, Lord, when I don't do it well. And before this congregation and before you, Lord, we as leaders, we want to do it well. We want to represent you well, Lord. We want to be tender. We want to be encouraging. We know, Lord, that there's going to be times when we say difficult things, but, Lord, there's a way we can say difficult things in love, and they can be encouraged, and they can be strengthened. And so, oh God, we just thank you for that. And help us as leaders to take serious the call to shepherd the flock of God and to watch over their souls, oh Lord. And raise up new leaders that want to do the same thing. Be with parents, Lord God, as they shepherd the little souls of their children, O oh Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness. We thank you for the privilege of being able to be the church, O oh God. We give you these things, and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Okay, let's, let's just uh, get to your seats and then remain standing. And let's close with a song that just exalts our Lord and our God. Father, we thank you for this morning. And just be lifted up, Lord. Be glorified, O oh God, as we worship you now.
Oh Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being the church. Thank you for the things you're teaching us on what that means. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, way to get after it. Let me tell you what, first service, I got a little worried. People just were, come on, come on, you can, and man, you clear, bam, you could, everybody. I think every, I looked out there and it, church was like empty and you were just all huddled around people praise the lord that's being the church we gotta we gotta just break away a little bit from isn't it it's amazing how conditioned we are what huh it's the middle of the service we gotta get up go Ooh, uh, i don't know if i'm comfortable is we just gotta get a little bit more relaxed so we can get equipped for what the lord has for us and part of that equipping Part of that ministry that takes place is an opportunity to be able to pray for you after the services. Don't ever leave here without being prayed for, for something that the Lord is speaking, for something that is going on in your hearts. We always have plenty of people up here and we have a lot of leaders that are sitting out there to where if we get two or three people deep or whatever, then we're gonna make sure that there are more that come up so that we can be praying for you. God bless you all. Have a great rest of the uh, day. Enjoy your home fellowships. If you haven't gone to a home fellowship, give one a try. And we'll see a lot of you on Wednesday and later on through the week. God bless you all.